So as you might be able to tell from my voice, I'm a little under the weather today. I'm not sure if it's allergies or a cold, so I hope you'll bear with me as I wrestle with speaking today. Last night I was practicing the sermon with AJ, and I thought, well, anyone who's a Golden Girls fan will be excited because I'm really bringing the Dorothy Zabornak to worship tomorrow. But it seems to be moving all around, so I'm not quite sure what we're going to get. So if we dive into this text, I really love this text. Um, For a little context, Jacob is an important figure in the Hebrew Bible, right? He's part of this chosen lineage. He's the, the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac. And before this moment when he's wrestling with the angel, long before Uh, He was born as a twin. He's the the youngest of twins. And Esau is his older twin brother. And because Esau is the eldest, he's entitled to the birthright, which means that he is entitled to double the inheritance from his father as Jacob is. And when when they're kids, at some point... Uh, Jacob is in that in the tent making some stew for dinner, and Esau comes in from a day out hunting, and he's famished. And as many of us are wont to do when we have low blood sugar, Esau makes a very poor decision, and that's that he sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of this stew because he's just so hungry. Now, later in life. Uh, uh, excuse me, Isaac is going to bestow a blessing onto Esau, further blessing. And Rebekah, who is Jacob and Esau's mother, favors Jacob. And so Rebekah conspires with Jacob to trick Isaac, who's gone nearly blind, into bestowing the blessing on Jacob instead of Esau. And so there are a few moments during their growing up that Jacob uh, is part of the manipulation and trickery of both his father and his brother Esau. So in this story, in the Jacob wrestling story, Jacob is on his way home. He has been living in a foreign land for many years, and he has decided that it's time to return home. But he knows that part of this returning home is to reconcile with his brother, whom he deceived so long ago. So he's on the way home, and he gets word that Esau is coming to meet him, and Esau is accompanied by 400 others. And so Jacob is logically very afraid that Esau has come with a vengeance. And so Jacob decides to split up his camp his very large family, in hopes that at least some will survive if they're attacked. And he sends his family across the river, and he's left alone by himself on the other side of the river. Now, what happens next is considered by many preachers to be a, a homiletical treasure trove, right? It's, it's rich with symbolism, and and the text also leaves many things open to question, many things open for interpretation. Last Monday, I met with a few people from the congregation for this monthly drama and creative play night that we've been doing, and we dove into this text, and uh, this really rich discussion emerged around it, and we also sat uh, with some colored pencils and crayons and drew images and stories and ideas, things that came up for us out of this text of Jacob wrestling. And it evoked many questions for us. One of the big questions that came up was, who was the man with whom Jacob wrestled? This story is traditionally described, and you've probably heard it called, Jacob wrestles with the angel or Jacob wrestles with God. Though if you look closely at the text, it's really not explicit who Jacob is wrestling with. And I really like, I don't have it on me, but if you look at the front page of the bulletin, the artwork that we selected this week, I love it. Um, may not be super clear, but if you, just, if you just do like a Google image search of Jacob wrestling, 
it, it's one of the first images to come up, and I love it because it's this cloaked kind of faceless figure that, that um, actually a nude Jacob is wrestling with, right? And it shows the kind of the, the juxtaposition of this vulnerability of Jacob in this moment and this, this cloaked, faceless, identityless individual with whom he's wrestling. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this, this man is God. It's some kind of in, incarnate form of God, or maybe it's an angel, some divine creature, especially in the moment when the creature, man, God, angel, renames Jacob, Israel, meaning one who has striven with God and humans. And also there's a moment at the end where Jacob renames the land that he is standing on, um, he, of the location of this encounter, Peniel, the face of God. So there's a lot of evidence that maybe this is God. But on the other hand, some commentaries I've read uh, argue that it's not God nor an angel, but perhaps Jacob wrestling with himself, wrestling with the inner Jacob, right? Or maybe even that it's his twin, Esau, because there's a little bit of evidence to say that Esau knows where Jacob is. In fact, Jacob may have dropped a few hints with his servants who went on before him to tell Esau where he could be found so they could kind of work out their, their beef together alone. It's my preference, though, to, to keep it open, to keep the interpretation open. I don't want to make any claims on who the man is or isn't. Because when Jacob asks the man for his name, he says, why is it that you ask my name? And it reminds me a lot of Jesus. Several times throughout the New Testament, when people are trying to figure out just who or what Jesus is, and he responds, who do you say I am? Perhaps these moments in scripture are better left to become precisely what we need for them to be in the moment. Regardless who the man is, the story, I think, embodies the age-old archetypal struggle between the human and the divine. And that the wrestling itself represents the coming together The point of intersection, the moment of collision between the two. That much is clear to me. Something divine is present in this story. Something divine is happening, and it is happening to a man who cheated his brother, and it's happening on his journey of reconciliation. And it is happening at night. It is happening at night, and the strange man is expressing some urgency about being gone by the time the morning comes around. Let me go, for the day is breaking, he says. Whatever divine thing is ordained to happen in this story must happen in the darkness. Now, when we use the word darkness or dark, we often use it to mean evil or bad. I've been hearing it a lot lately, especially with reference to our current political season. Dark times. There's so much darkness in the world right now. His or her policies or history or practices are just dark. But texts like this text, the Jacob wrestling text, they challenge that notion that darkness is bad or evil. They challenge that notion in that the divine meeting happens in the darkness. And it cannot happen after daybreak. It's important to me for two reasons, to reframe our notions about darkness. The biggest reason is that 
notions of dark equaling bad and consequently light equaling good have both supported and created the racist framework and system that we are all embedded in. When we do not honor and celebrate darkness, we unconsciously teach our children to avoid brown and black crayons. And we remain unconscious to the bias all around us against darkness. My black and brown siblings have taught me repeatedly that the ways that we demonize dark and glorify light does harm to their souls and their lives. Now, the second reason we might reframe our notions of darkness is that when we vilify darkness, we miss out on all that it has to teach us, show us, offer us. To immediately dismiss the political season or anything in our lives, any person, any struggle, as dark or darkness, to just dismiss it, is to miss the divine encounter that happens in the darkness, that moment of divine and human collision. So I have a challenge for us. I challenge us to think of this the next time we're tempted to refer to something as dark or evil as darkness. I challenge us to upset our own notions of darkness and to begin to imbue them with different meanings. Many sacred things happen in the darkness. As I have been planting bulbs for the spring, I'm awestruck by what's happening down in the cold, damp ground in the darkness. What beauty is being prepared for springtime when winter breaks into a new day? The divine encounter of life and material in the ground is the location of a miracle. When our civil discourse seems to be anything but civil, when racism and misogyny and lying and cheating and stealing and egotism and ableism on on and on and on are on full blast on the television, it fills our hearts with fear and shame. I know that I haven't slept well in a week since I watched the last debate. It has troubled my heart. It has troubled my heart not only because I've been the target of gendered violence, but also because what I have seen on stage is, to me, not just individuals, but a reflection of the collective sin of our nation, the collective sins of all manner of supremacist and violent frameworks And I'm wrestling with that. I'm wrestling with my own complicity, and I'm wrestling with my own old wounds. My temptation is to abandon it all, to pretend it doesn't exist, to go on my merry way. Because after all, my life may not be changed all that much anyway by the outcome of this election. After all, I'm a middle-class, able-bodied white woman with an education. But this story reminds me that the wrestling, the wrestling with my hurts and the wrestling with my complicity in a time that makes me sometimes feel all alone and very afraid, it reminds me that that is a divine moment. Something is happening. Something is happening as it can only happen in the darkness. The prelude to reconciliation. 
just as it could not happen for Jacob in the daytime, cannot happen for us in the midst of the status quo. We must hold on to our divine adversary in the midst of the darkness until we are blessed. Until we know that we can move forward into a new day, we must wrestle and hold on and strive with God and humans alike until the sun comes up. We will not arrive unscathed. We will arrive knocked out a joint, much like Jacob's hip, off balance, off kilter, because the divine collision takes work, real, physical, and spiritual labor. And it is dangerous. It is not for the faint of spirit. This faith is not for the faint of spirit. It is for those who refuse to let go until they are blessed. And some nights are longer than others. These are dark times. Not because they are evil. Not because they are troubling. Not because they are upsetting. No, these are dark times because they are fertile times. They are filled with divinity. They are filled with blessing. Rich with the potential for great reconciliation. Rich with the potential for fantastic forgiveness. And for radical repentance. May we hold on until we have our blessing. Amen.